We wave high the flag of freedom as a patriotic reminder to never take our independence for granted. Fireworks explode into the night sky, lighting up the darkness, reminding us of our nation's calling in the world. One nation under God. We look into the sky and remember that for all the freedom we have to We wave high the flag of freedom as a patriotic reminder to never take our independence for granted. Fireworks explode into the night sky, lighting up the darkness, reminding us of our nation's calling in the world. One nation under God. We look into the sky and remember that for all the freedom we have to celebrate, we must never forget our dependence on God. It was by His hand we were afforded our independence. So we might stand for liberty, remembering He set us free from the bondage of sin. So we might stand for justice, for the Lord loves justice, and He will not forsake His saints. So we might stand for freedom, because we know that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there... If you would please stand with me, it's so great to be able to um, just uh, it, celebrate this freedom that we have, our religious freedom and our freedom in this country. And we're going to take some time to do that this morning. So let's sing together. Father, we are so thankful to be here this morning, to be able to celebrate our freedom, the freedom that we have in you, to just to praise and worship you this morning. And just we are just so very thankful for that opportunity to live in this great country that we do and to just take advantage of all those things that you have afforded us. And we just want to take time to thank you for that. Please be with us as we worship this morning and we'll give you the praise in Jesus name. Amen.
my sin was heavy but chains break out the weight of your glory i needed shelter i was an orphan now you call me a citizen of
Father, I thank you so much for coming into this place with us today. Father, I thank you so much today. We want to honor those who served in the armed forces to grant us our freedom. We want to thank you and praise you for those men and women who were willing to do that to secure our freedom. Father, our country needs to turn back to you, and I pray that through the messages that we hear today that we can be a small part of helping our country turn back to God. Father, we thank you so much for all you have done for us. In your name I pray, amen. Okay. <laughs> Woo! It's good morning. It's good to have everybody here this morning. For those who are joining at home and those who are here today, we celebrate July 4th, our freedom in this country, and it's an exciting time. Of course, it's weird this year because the 4th is on a Tuesday. So I got to come into the church tomorrow, but then Tuesday I'm off. I'm like, what? That didn't work right. There's no extended weekend with that, but that's okay. Today, we're going to be talking about temptation. No, you should have gone, dun, dun, dun. When I was growing up, I'm not much of a fisherman. I will admit that straight up, but that's okay. But my dad would take us fishing, and, and I remembered a couple things, and I may have shared this before, but, and he doesn't even remember this, but I love star crunches to this day because of our fishing trips and Coca-Cola. I don't think my mom knew that that's what our treats were when we were in the boat fishing, but I loved it. But one thing I did not love was putting the bait on the hook, and it didn't matter what kind of bait it was. Most of the time, it was a worm, and just... There's something about it that I'm just like, this doesn't feel right. But then once I got it, well, actually then once my dad would put the bait on the hook, then I would fish and then I'd catch fish. And I didn't like taking the fish off the hook. You see the dilemma, this, this was kind of tough. And, and so for the longest time, I didn't like to put the bait on the hook and I didn't like to take the fish off the hook. So there was a dilemma with this fishing thing. And for years, this happened to me. I just was always like, oh, I'm sorry, worm. And just, you know, but it's, someone, it's a fish's dinner, you know, and it just didn't work right. But then I have had the opportunity, the pleasure of over 20 years of being a dean at a Christian camp. And I have loved it every year. And there was one year I was down at Camp Allendale in Trafalgar, Indiana. And I was the dean. And down there, they get to pick the activities each day what the kids want to do. And so that year, they added fishing. And so I mentioned it to the kids like, ooh, you know, we got this and this and this and there's fishing. Oh, fishing, let's go fishing. <sighs> Okay, let's do that. So we got out there and it was on a little dock and I had like six or seven kids in my group at the time and none of them wanted to put the bait on the hook. And so I had to be an adult and I put the bait on the hook for each of them. But then of course, some of them actually caught fish too. And I'm just like, Lord, help me here. 
But the thing was, I kind of got over it, and I took the fish off the hook, and I rebaited. But when you use bait for fishing, sometimes I have learned that you can use different bait to catch different fish. I think that day it was a little bit easier because it was frozen corn. So like, I didn't have to worry about the worm. So that maybe was my, my baby step into going into putting the worm on the hook. And so sometimes when we go fishing, we have to make sure we've got the right bait to catch the fish. But it's interesting to me that Satan uses things that are different for every person. He uses a bait, a bait that we might get caught up in with anger or lust or greed or power. And each one of us have something different that we may struggle with. But it's interesting because as that bait gets ready to try to hook us from the temptation, he will toss, hopefully I don't catch anybody, out and just kind of dangle it out there. Oh, no, it's going to get caught. Okay, good. And it gets maybe not a bite that time. But then he'll throw it out again and again thinking that maybe at this point they're going to say yes to that temptation where that temptation becomes a sin. I want you to know, though, temptation will happen. You are not immune to it. Jesus himself was tempted by Satan. Temptation will happen in our lives. Temptation itself is not a sin. But when we allow that sin to be in our lives. When we allow it to change our world, that's when we get into the territory. It's not good. That's when sin takes birth and grabs hold. Jesus was tempted by Satan three times, and every time Jesus responded with Scripture. Satan tried but he failed with Jesus. And we even see in Hebrews that Jesus was tempted in every way. And that's really weird for me to think. Wait a minute, Jesus was tempted with power? Yeah. He was was tempted with lust? Yeah. He was tempted by the things that we are tempted by, yet he did not sin. And it's interesting as we're looking at the life of Joseph. Joseph is an interesting guy because I tell you what, there are a lot of things that bad that happened to Joseph in his life. And sometimes just misunderstanding, sometimes it may be in the wrong spot at the wrong time, but Joseph, his world changed as what Steve started last week. We're gonna continue today. And we got chapter 39. So if you have your Bibles or on your phone, I don't mind as long as you're looking at the Bible. Genesis chapter 39. And we're going to be looking at that today to see some of the things that we may believe with temptation. And I don't want you to believe the lie. Because temptation will happen, but I don't want you to believe the lie. And there are three things I feel that that often we see in Scripture that will draw us in to be tempted. But it's how we respond is the important thing. The first thing that we see is the lust of the world. Now, with lust, that that is a desire for something. It could be for another person. It could be for power. It could be for pride. It could be so many different things. But in 1 John chapter 2, in verse 16, John tells us some of these, these three lusts that he talks about. He says, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh... The lust of the eyes and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. God does not tempt us. The world will reveal to us many temptations that may be very tempting to take that bite, to take the bait. But yet, 
we see with these three things, one of the things we struggle with is on a daily basis with me being a very visual person and in our society, a lot of things are very visual today. I mean, you think of movies, you think, I mean, YouTube is amazingly popular, especially with kids and they'll watch 15 second clips on TikTok and, you know, and all these different things that people want to see things happen to people, good or bad. They want to learn a new thing from somebody, good or bad. And there's so many different things being thrown at us today that it's just that lust of the world, that desire that we're going to be seeing. And we're going to see that with Joseph in, Joseph chap in Genesis chapter 39. But we also see it the, in the influence of other people, in the influence of others. Sometimes the people you hang around with are the ones that bring the temptation. Sometimes we have to look around the circle that we're around and we're like, is this a good circle to be in? They may be the ones to say, hey, this won't hurt too much or this won't be bad too much. And you're like, well, you're right. You did it. It's not bad, right? But the influence of others can be very strong. I see that especially when I, when I talk to the kids down there. The, the peer pressure, even in elementary school today, to see, to do things to act more adult than they need to be, those things, it drives me crazy. Because the kids shouldn't be dealing with things that they are at fourth and fifth grade or eighth grade or even as a senior in high school. Because the world is throwing so much at them and they are being tempted. But how are we helping them with those temptations as well? The influence of others can be very, very strong. But also, part of the lie that we believe is the environment that we're in. The environment you choose to be. If you are one that struggles with drunkenness and you go regularly to a bar where they serve lots of alcohol, is that a wise decision? Oh, I'm okay, I'm not gonna do it tonight but maybe your friends are there or maybe, and, and there's that influence that comes in. But the environment you choose, sometimes we're putting ourselves in these situations to be tempted for something that maybe we could easily avoid. Joseph had a very interesting situation. We see the three of these, the lust of the world, the influence of others, and the environment that we're in. All three of these things happen with Joseph in, in chapter 39 of Genesis. To catch you up if you weren't here last week, Joseph, his brothers didn't like him because he had a couple dreams. And he was kind of bragging about it. He was young, you know, didn't know better. And they said, we got to get rid of him. I mean, he had a lot of brothers, a lot. And they're like, oh, we can't kill him. Let's throw him in a well. And then they decided to sell him. And so we see, starting in verse, uh, chapter 39, what happens from there. Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelites, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. So the Ishmaelites were the ones that got him, that they gave money to the brothers to take Joseph away. Potiphar bought him off of the Ishmaelites. I hope you're following along here with the story, what's happening here. So now he is part of Potiphar's household. But it's an amazing thing that happens. Verse two, it says, the Lord was with Joseph so he, that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Everything. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. 
With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except for the food that he ate. So, setting the situation up, it was a very bad situation, obviously, being in a well. I've never been in one, but I never really would like to, to find out how bad it would be to be in a well. Then you get sold as a slave. And then you get sold again to be a part of this man's household, to be helping him in his house for the day-to-day -day things. But the Lord was blessing Joseph, and Potiphar took notice, and he said, hmm, there is something good about this. I'm going to put him in charge of everything. Everything he owned in that house, he trusted Joseph. That is a lot of trust. Because he had bought him, he didn't know maybe his history, he didn't know, but he saw things. He saw things. And so when we see that temptation will happen, I don't want you to believe the lie. But instead, I want you to focus on the truth. That's what Joseph did. In this situation, he was able to focus on the truth. And so as we continue on in this chapter and seeing what happens in his situation, the first that we see today is that he had trust in God's guidance. Even when he had the dreams with his brothers, even back then, he was, he was younger, but, but yet he was sharing these things. He thought it was a positive thing. They obviously did not. But then he got to Potiphar's house, and he continued to trust God. Now you're saying, how do we know that? We're going to see in a little bit how exactly we know that he was trusting in God's guidance. Because this man's story, there is so many ups and downs in this story that this man had to trust in God. Because, I mean, he went from this guy who was a favorite of his dad's with many sons. He had his own coat, a really cool colored coat. I don't know what it looked like, but I would have loved to have seen what it looked like. Was that, was that me? Was I talking too loud? So... Ooh, that, that was an amazing coat. <laughs> so he had that. And then a little bit later on, he was put in charge of Potiphar's household. And that was an honor in that day, honestly. And for him to be able to trust him completely with only the food that he was going to eat. Potiphar was probably gone a lot because he was a high official in the Pharaoh's palace. So he was probably not around a lot. So he trusted this man and put him in charge. But we see that Joseph was trusting in God's guidance. And sometimes with temptation, sometimes we're not trusting God in every situation. And we think, oh, I've got it this time, God. And he's like, uh, no. You need to be listening. You need to be trusting me because I know what's best for you. And Joseph, he saw that. We get to the next part. The second that I want you to understand about the truth is that we need to resist the urge. Now we get into the fun part of the story. I always love when Steve gives me uh, topics like this. I think he does that intentionally to me to see how well the children's minister handles something like this. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife, Potiphar's wife, took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. She didn't want to just sleep. So, Joseph was young. He was full of muscles and just beauty. 
just, you look at Joseph and you're like, whoa. And she said that too. And she was like, come to bed with me. And we see the first time of Joseph's response there. He refused in verse 8. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. Now I find this very interesting that it doesn't say that's earlier when Potiphar put everything in charge. He said everything except for food. Joseph added the wife. Now, I'm not, I, I don't want to speculate with that of what with Potiphar, but it's interesting. He would have been gone. He wouldn't have known. He had the opportunity. The bait was there. But he refused. He refused. He resisted the urge. He easily could have done this. He easily could have had this affair with her. Easily. No one would have known he was in charge of the house. He could have just said, everybody get out of the house. But he didn't. He resisted the urge. And he said, no, your husband put me in charge of everything and I could do anything except things with you. He resisted that. But the, it's interesting because she doesn't give up because he was very muscular and very good looking and she took notice and every time she would see him, Joseph, come to bed with me. And he would say, no, Joseph, come to bed with me. And he would say, no. And we were just constantly seeing this back and forth between the two of them every day. And Joseph, I'm sure at one point, was looking at his environment and saying, how can I avoid her today? Because after so many times you're saying no, he's just like, well, <sighs> no one would know. It wouldn't hurt anybody. But that's where we get to the next part where we understand the consequences. We understand the consequences. Joseph understood that after he talks about his master's household, his earthly master's household, he talks about his heavenly father. Look what he says there. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Yes, Joseph. I love this, that he gives us a great example on resisting temptation. He understood the consequences. And a lot of times when we see that bait and we see it, whatever bait that might entice you, that might bring that desire, and we maybe even think it over. Mm, may not be too bad. No one will know. It's very easy to hide it. But yet, where does he go? He understood the consequences and he said, I I cannot sin against God. That's how I knew, that's how I know that when he trusted in God's guidance, God was blessing him, yes, but more importantly, Joseph was trusting God. He was trusting him in every circumstance, including those times where he was tempted. And he resisted that urge. He resisted the urge and he understood the consequences. It's often we look at stories from scripture and we're like, oh, well, they didn't have things that we have today. They didn't have some of those temptations. They may not have had exact same things of what we may have today. They didn't have technology and such, but they had 
temptations. There was a temple specifically set where you can go and be with a prostitute to worship in certain cities. There was temptation everywhere they would go in the Old Testament and the New, especially in places that did not honor God. There were many worldly ways going on and there were many worldly opportunities to take advantage of those things. But yet, he understood. He understood the consequences. But we see what his reaction every day was. Now, it would have worked better to run away, yes, but that wouldn't give me the acronym TRUTH. So instead, we're going to say that he turned away. He turned away. When he saw the temptation, he turned away. One of the things that I tell the kids regularly down there for them to understand is that we will face temptation. But we will face those things, but if we turn away from it and we turn to God, he is going to help us through those situations. And if kids understand that, then you should be able to as well. That I should be able to understand that as well. Because there is a point that temptation becomes the sin. And, and we've taken that step too far. Thank God that Jesus took it even a step further on the cross. Because there are many times in my life that I'm like, oh, I messed up again. This week was one of those weeks that I was traveling a lot, not for church stuff necessarily, but my wife was sick. And so the kids and I went on a Goodwill trip on Friday. Yeah, we hit like five Goodwills in the Indianapolis area. Oh, it was way too much stuff. The kids loved it. But, and then yesterday we went down to Noblesville to spend some time with two of my nephews and, and my mom and dad. And everywhere I was going, everywhere, and I'm, that's not an exaggeration. Sometimes I exaggerate, but this I'm not sure if it's an exaggeration. I got behind people that were going 10 to 15 miles below the speed limit everywhere I went. Now, I understand being cautious, but when it's 40 miles an hour for the zone and you're going 25, you're causing some problems. You really shouldn't be behind the wheel if you're that concerned. And I'm like, Lord, here I'm talking about this temptation and I'm just ready to hit the horn. And, and when I hit the horn, I'm done. I've told you that before. I hit the horn, I'm done. I've let my anger out, but I'm just like, that bait is there right now. Am I going to take it? Even this morning, there's no one on the road when I come to church in the morning. Never. And this morning, someone was going 10 miles, 15 miles, and then they would go up a couple more and then back down. And I'm like, Lord, I saw the bait. It's very easy. It's very easy to get caught up in those things. But when we understand that the circumstance, the consequences of that, it's much easier than to be able to turn away like Joseph did. He resisted. He resisted every time that woman said, hey, come with me. And he said, no. And then it got to the point that he said no so much that she caught him one time. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties in verse 11. And none of the household servants were inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and he ran out of the house. That is literally turning away from the temptation. She's got him by the cloak and he runs away and just leaves it, kind of the outer garment, almost like a coat for them. And he left 
But this was her opportunity because she was tired of him not saying yes to her. So she devised a plan. And she realized, she called the servants together, the household servants, and said, look, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard he scre screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. That is not how the story went. She kept his cloak beside her till Potiphar came home. Notice how the wording changes here. He was in charge of the household, but notice the wording that she uses, and it's so different and mean, really. She told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought came to us to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She had proof. She had proof. The master heard the story his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. This is the same guy that put Joseph in charge of his entire household. But one lie changed all that like that. He took him and he put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. It's interesting when we talk about turning away. There's a verse in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. <clears throat> it says, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with all those who call on the Lord with a pure heart. Paul was directing Timothy, a young man himself, to be able to pursue the right things. Joseph was trying to pursue the right things, but he got once again put into a bad situation. He got put in prison. But I love how God works. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Does that sound familiar? It should. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. The thing with temptation, we have to realize that it can be very tempting. That bait is there, but our help, our help to get through it it comes from the Lord. And part of the ways that God puts that in our lives, he given a, he's given us his word, the truth, the Bible, that we can read to give, help us along the way. But he has also put other people in our lives to be able to help us, to keep each other accountable, to keep each other lifted up. This past year and a half, Bob Tyler and I have been meeting uh, weekly. And... We started this, he come to me and asked to be able to be accountability and to uh, discipleship. And so we've been doing this for a year and a half. We study a chapter of the Bible every week. And it has been such a blessing to see how he has grown, but also I've been benefited from it as well. And recently, him and I sat down and I had just a couple questions to him to ask. So I'd like you to watch the, the video right now. Hey everybody, this is Michael, and I'm here today with Bob Tyler, and Bob and I, the last year and a half, have met together for a discipleship accountability group, and we meet weekly, and we go through one chapter of the Bible every week, and we have that discussion and have some kind of application every week. So Bob, my first question for you is how did you come about wanting to do this accountability with me? Well, first of all, I've been thinking about and praying about this for a long time, uh, specifically for the purpose of finding a trustworthy and confidential person. I needed a person like you to challenge and chart my goal, progress from my goal, which was honoring God by honoring my wife, Sally. I wanted to start 
what we were doing, a weekly study with a lesson, but I was thinking also about that lesson with the idea of an application like the, our church uh, weekly uh, Bible written lesson. Uh, the application is very important from the standpoint of uh, charting out what you plan to do to the week to increase your faith as a result of that. I'm just curious as to, like, what would you consider some of the benefits that we have been meeting now for over a year and a half? And I feel like I've seen a lot of benefits, but I wanted to hear your perspective on that. Well, you know, transparency and confidentiality, what that does, it allows you, allowed me to be real and make meaningful progress uh, with my goal. Uh, specifically, and it's it's been huge from that standpoint. You um, people don't realize that when you're transparent and have confidentiality, that that's when you can go forward with that progress. Again, formulating that application has been so huge um, because uh, really, you it allows you to not only. <clears throat> chart your path for the coming week and helping others but it's just specifically uh, when you write it down you know you can think and talk but when you write it down that means you can refer back to it also I think I'm becoming a little better listener and I'm attempting to do less talking but I, <laughs> but I have a smiley face and that's been a challenge for him so <laughs> But, uh, but no, I've really appreciated the time as well, and I knew that, you know, with Bob, it would help him, but you don't realize, like, how much it helps, it helped me this past year and a half as well. And so I just wanted to encourage you to consider um, finding someone to be able to be in a discipleship relationship with. Bob and I just wanted to share a little bit today about our experience. It may be a little different for you, but hopefully you'll be able to find someone to be able to have similar or same experience that we had. Thanks for listening. Our discipleship ministry is really trying to encourage this, and there are people that are here at our church that are willing to get into a relationship like what Bob and I have with this this past year and a half, and to be able to help each other and to be accountable and to, to grow in the faith. Because as brothers and sisters in Christ, there should be that opportunity to come to someone and say, I need help today. I need prayer today. And because it's going to be so much easier facing those temptations when we know that someone's praying for us. We know someone we're going to meet and they may ask the tough questions. So I encourage you to consider that as well to be able to maybe find someone to meet one-on-one -on -one. and on a regular basis or it could be maybe set up a little bit differently. But the great thing that we see is that the help that we desire, the help that we want, it comes from the Lord. I'm always encouraged when I read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verse 13, where Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and Corinth was kind of messed up. They had a lot of things going on that were not good at times. But Listen what he says to them. He says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. There is nothing new that you're, fall that you're falling temptation. Someone, somewhere, has experienced the same thing. And he goes on, he says, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No matter how much the bait looks good, there's always a way out with God. And sometimes he removes, ow, that situation. That's what happens when you use live hooks. But sometimes that situation we just need to give to God and say, I can't handle it on my own. I need your help. Provide a way out. And often we think, oh, it's going to be this big door that he's going to open up and say, oh, go through this door. Oh, it should be so easy like that, right? But sometimes it's just 
his word. Something comes from the Bible or a scripture you remember or somebody calling you or texting you or, or talking to you and you're like, oh yeah, they didn't know what was going on but they just shared maybe one of their favorite scriptures or, or something that maybe they were encouraged by recently. He will never let you go so much where you can't handle it your own. But we try, we try to do it on our own. He says, no, let me help you because he desires that. He wants his people to be holy. He wants us to be set apart from the world. And part of that is dealing with temptation. Finally, I want to finish with the f most famous prayer, I would say probably, that we are familiar with. It's often called the Lord's Prayer. It's more the disciples' prayer, in my opinion. But, but Jesus gave them this prayer. And he, he says something in the middle of it in Matthew 6, 13, about temptation. Jesus knew we were going to be tempted. He was tempted by Satan. And look what he says there. He says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That day when he was tempted by Satan, there were three times that Satan put this in front of him and it could have been very, very appealing to Jesus. There was power, there was prestige. There, there, there was these things that the world would take notice. But every time, Jesus responded with God's word. And every time he resisted the devil and every time he was victorious. We can be too, not on our own strength, but when we pray something like this, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It will happen, but don't believe the lie. Focus on the truth. Trust in God's guidance. Resist the urge. Understand the consequences. Turn away and let God help you. Let the help that he desires to give you come from him and take it and live it out and let it change your world. Today, we give an opportunity every time that a message is brought, every time a situation we come up that this is all possible because of Jesus. Because he was tempted in every way yet did not sin. But yet even as a sinless God in the flesh, they crucified him. They abused him. And they put him on a cross to die. And Satan thought he won, finally, but he was wrong. Because Jesus conquered over sin, he conquered over death, and every temptation that may come our way, every sin that has been in our life or will be a temptation along the way, Jesus' blood was shed for that. And maybe you haven't made that decision today to be a follower of Jesus, to, to be baptized in the water, to be a new creation and come out fresh, a new believer. Maybe you have something in your life that you just say, I need prayer right now. We have a next steps room over there that you are welcome to as we going to, to be doing this time. I'm going to pray and you can go over there and someone, an elder will be there to be able to talk to you, to pray with you. And I encourage you, if you need that today, go do that. That's why they go there every week. And they love doing that. That's part of their ministry. It's part, part of the opportunity. So right now, as I do with the kids, can you help me out? Can everybody snap, clap, and put your hands in the lap? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for everything that you do. And I thank you so much, Jesus, that every temptation that has come in my life when I was younger and even now, 
you have dealt with. And I thank you that you, you were able to say no. And sometimes that's hard. Sometimes it's hard when temptation, that bait comes to us. But I pray that we trust you. That we live for you. And may the world see you in us. Thank you for this time. We love you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Good morning. This is the time we worship by celebrating the Lord's Supper. And if you're a Christian, you are welcome to join in celebrating communion. And we had communion cups at the back when you come in. If you did not get one, raise your hand and somebody will help bring one to you. Okay, we're good. Well, as you've already heard and you're aware of, Tuesday is July 4th, our Independence Day, or the day that we celebrate the birth of our country. In 1776, 247 years ago, the leaders of our 13 colonies adopted the Declaration of Independence. And in that declaration, they cited injuries and usurpations by the King of England who was trying to establish absolute tyranny over the colonies. And they said, we're going to separate and become our own country. And one of the famous lines from that document is this, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now note, first of all, that these men believed that God existed. They believed that he created us, and he believed that he gave us rights. The government doesn't give it to us. The government's role is to protect those rights. Those rights are from God. So as a result of that declaration, the Revolutionary War was fought to then gain our independence and to ensure that our citizens have those rights. Now I believe there's a spiritual analogy to this. As a result of the fall, we became slaves to sin and the flesh and eventually to eternal death. In John 8, 34, we read, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. In Romans 3, 23, we read, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus came to earth as a man and fought the spiritual battle against Satan to provide our freedom and eternal life for us. So John 8, 36, just two verses after that first one. So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And in Romans 6, verses 6 and 7, we read, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. And then finally, another verse, Revelation 1.5, John wrote, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. So I believe that the day we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and are baptized is our spiritual independence day, our freedom from eternal punishment. So just as we celebrate our country's freedom and independence on July 4th, as Christians, we should celebrate our spiritual freedom and independence every time we partake of communion because it is a reminder of our freedom from sin and eternal punishment. Let's pray. Almighty God, we acknowledge that you are our creator and you have given us these unalienable rights. I thank you that our government has protected these rights and will continue to do so. But we also confess that we are sinners in need of salvation or freedom and independence from the eternal punishment for our sins. Thank you that you have given us that freedom through the death and resurrection of your son Jesus 
for all who have accepted him as their Savior and Lord. We celebrate and thank you for the freedom as we partake of this communion. And we also thank you for the freedom and independence of our nation, as hopefully we'll all celebrate this week. But let us remember and never forget that there is a price to be paid for freedom. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you all for coming today. And just a couple of quick announcements. First of all, I just want to uh, personally say thank you to everybody who helped at Kids in the Meadow this past month on Monday nights. We averaged about 70 kids in our community and we're hoping to maybe even reach out to some of those families to, to be a part here. And next week, next Sunday, if you come in and you see stuff on the floor, it looks like a game board. Please do not move it because you'll get back, you be put back to start because VBS starts uh, next Sunday night. So there will be a game board going through the church. So please do not touch or move those. Or that, if you do, actually, it's an automatic like, hey, I'm going to volunteer for VBS. So uh, if you want to, I'd be glad to have you. So that starts next Sunday night at 6 o'clock to 8.30 every night till Thursday from the 9th to the 13th. And there are a lot of other things coming up this week. One other quick announcement too, for the youth group for tonight, plans of changing because of the possible storms. It's not good to swim in storms. So it's being moved to the church at five o'clock instead of four. So families are still welcome to come, uh, but it'll be from five to eight tonight instead of the at four at the Griles house. So please make note of that junior and senior high and their parents. And I think that was all I had, I hope. One last thing, um, as we stand, can you stand? I'm gonna offer a word of prayer and then they're gonna lead uh, God Bless America as we finish up here today. But let's pray. Lord, you are good. We thank you for everything that you do. We thank you for this time that we have 
And we pray for each of us here or watching online that every day, Lord, we seek you out. We trust you, knowing that this world will throw a lot at us, but we can handle it because of you. Thank you for that. Thank you for everything you do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. And if you could help with cheers afterwards. Thanks. God bless America. through